Hi, everyone. It's Mind Rolling, and I am back. I am Raghu, and I am back with uh, a brand new friend, but you're not so brand new. We've been talking and Zooming for a bit. Rob Roser, Robert, welcome. It's great to be with you, Raghu. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, we have quite a bit to talk about. And, um, but just to give you a little bit of an idea, well, I first want to say when we first met, you know how it is with sometimes you meet somebody and there's a bit of a, not a bit of, there's a real kindred spirit thing going on. And, uh, and, and the most, uh, pertinent part of that meeting was, uh, when, we we're talking about the two. Rob comes from Buddhist tradition, and is engaged in the Buddhist tradition, and he well knows my tradition, our tradition, which is a little bit funky because it's not all focused in the way people like to have stuff focused in, and uh, it is of course bhakti yoga, but our tradition comes from Neem Karoli Baba, who was not one thing or another and had us involved with all sorts of, uh, without saying a word, somehow we became involved with Buddhist practice. And uh, so you said, well, or I don't know if you said, but maybe whoever introduced me said it to me that you were basically a closet bhakti. Did, <laughs> I don't know. If I think it was a friend of ours, a mutual friend. Yeah, who's right. Thought that you were looking for a bhakti Buddhist. Yes, sort. right. <laughs> we're on the we're on the lookout for bhakti Buddhist. Yeah. Um, so it's not a bad thing. You, you don't mind? No, I, I take it as a badge of honor. Bhakti yoga, <laughs> <laughs> a badge of lovely honor. <laughs> uh, so uh, Rob teaches as a professor at Penn State, and uh, my God. Uh, and it's so it's it, what you specifically it's the Bennett Pierce prof, uh, your Bennett Pierce professor of care, compassion and human development. Is that yes? Do, do yes, I have thanks, the right thing going on there? Thanks to the gift of Edna Bennett Pierce, she created a chair in compassion at Penn State. If you oh, can really? Oh. With my friend Mark Greenberg, I think it was yeah, a beautiful offering to the oh, world. Wow. So I feel yeah. most grateful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a really beautiful offering. Um. And uh, the other thing, of course, that uh, is your work with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit of anything I hear or we can hear about His Holiness on any level is um, changes the uh, atmosphere immediately. Yes, I, I got introduced to His Holiness through the, the work of the Mind and Life Institute that I, I think you're aware of that has mm -hmm. been trying to sort of bring some of the science of contemplation and its uh, value in the world to the forefront. And he's been a, a young, as a young man, he was interested in science. And obviously, to make a long story short, he became very enamored with the dialogue between the contemplative science, uh, the contemplatives, <laughs> such as himself, and the scientists, uh, especially of the brain, to try to bring some new understanding of our possibility for transformation into the world. And the part of that work that I've been most involved in, that His Holiness has also been an incredible leader and light uh, for, has been this idea of educating the heart. Um, mm. you know, he, he likes to, His Holiness sometimes quotes, or maybe it's us, <laughs> who sometimes quote Aristotle as saying, an education of the mind without an education of the heart is no education at all. And so the Dalai Lama has really been bringing together um, contemplatives and scientists and educational folks to think about how we may re-envision um, sort of education, but also human development of, to focus on the whole child, the whole person, and not to forget about, um, you know, just the hand, of course, the head, but also the heart is really important to, uh, so it's been a great honor and, <laughs> um, and he has a wonderful sense of humor and he has a sharp mind and just amazing to interact with such a, a person. Yeah. 
I feel very, very lucky. fortunate. Yeah, you know, very, I mean, <laughs> very, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, how did you get there? How did you get to the point where you think that meeting His Holiness would be a good thing when you were a lot younger? How, what, what, uh, what, what are the little things or the big things that uh, turned it around for you that you are not just your mind? your emotions, all of that stuff. You know, Raghu, I'll just be honest with you. (laughs) I think suffering, um, I think there was a lot of twists and turns and dead ends and detours, as Carl Jung put it. That's the path of development and wholeness. And, um, you know, I'll just say three things. I quit graduate school uh, uh, after two years and studied with a Catholic theologian named Matthew Fox. Oh yeah, and and there I was introduced to the great traditions of contemplative traditions of the East, and fell in love with Hinduism, to be honest, and started to practice in a yoga tradition. And the more I practiced in that tradition, I thought, and I was studying, and then I went back to graduate school. <laughs> so, so I quit. I had this opening to this new possibility, and went back. And one of the things that really struck me was the way that teaching and learning happened in an ashram setting Hmm. um, seemed to be um, not the same as the way I was thinking about teaching and learning and child development. There were some unique features to it. Um, The idea that learning wasn't just about building up your knowledge, which we call constructivism, but... um, uh, I remember Swami sometimes saying, our job is to help people discover who they are. And they would be making this hand motion. <laughs> and the idea clearly was that learning could be also a process of subtraction, not just addition. And so that was different than the East. And then the idea of practicing without knowing, <laughs> practicing, med- where is it going? How does one do this? Um, how does one cook for 50 people, you know, all of these things were happening. Um, So doing and learning without understanding initially, not knowing as a really important way to approach the process of learning and to acknowledge that. So I started to see these, um, I started to imagine there could be a dialogue between these different ways of thinking about what human development was and teaching and learning. And to be honest, I was at Stanford University at the time in the School of Ed, and I thought this was a big loser of a project, what? <laughs> studying this explicitly um, at that time as an untenured faculty member. And so um, I traveled to India during the years I was at Stanford, and I created a, I had this beautiful bookcase. And four of the sections of the bookcase were American psychology, European, and then the last one was Hindu and Buddhist psychology. And I said, after I get tenure, I'll study that. And then I got thrown out. I didn't get tenure. <laughs> you did? <laughs> no. and, but I did get a Fulbright to go to India to study schools that were using meditation as my job at this institution, Wayne, that came. And when I came home from that, all of a sudden I said, how am I going to do this study in America? I've always wanted to mix these. I found Mind and Life was already doing it. And they had this network that was run by Richie Davidson and Mark Greenberg called, uh, we called it MLEARN, Mind and Life Educational Research Network. And for about six years together, we just um, invited people to, to teach us what they knew about this and to listen and to think about a strategy for how we might study and bring some of these ideas of East and West together about educating the whole person in the heart and the head and the hand how might we do this together? So I didn't have to figure it out. I, I struggled, I struggled. And then like the great spiritual story, <laughs> it was already happening in my own backyard. I just had to you know, join right. with that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, so boy. that was lucky. And that led to his holiness and this, um, this, this work. Hmm. You spent a, a, quite a bit of time in India then, right? Yeah, I started in 93 and I, you know, until this year, I've been going there pretty faithfully. So uh-huh. I've learned a lot there, and I have a great sympathy and <laughs> love of the tradition and the where, people. Where were you mostly? What part of India? I find myself, I, I tend to be attracted for some unknown reason to Maharashtra. And so being mm-hmm. in Mumbai, 
And the Tansa Valley to the north um, was a place of many siddhas. Um, and then, you know, Yaneshwar and Tukaram. Mm. So it was a very rich area for spirituality of the common person. And this was also the place I did my Fulbright and was studying different schools, bringing in these contemplative practices. I was curious, why would they do that? And what did the kids think? And how did it go? And Boy, you had the perfect causes and conditions, circumstances to create what was needed to be created in you to do what you're doing. Uh, it's uh, pretty graceful, I must say. Um, it's like Schopenhauer sometimes. I, I think Schopenhauer said it you, only in retrospect. <laughs> yeah. Can you see that? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. not yeah. going forward sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but in some of the stuff that uh, just look that I've looked over of things that you've done and so on, and of course the the main uh, thrust is with working with youth. Obviously, you're working in a university and you're working with young adults, basically. And and I look through all the advisals that you you give in various. Uh, papers or talks or whatever and as far as i'm concerned it's all right on i mean these young adults end up being young adults when they're like 75 okay i don't <laughs> see i don't see that as an age thing i see everybody can use all of the things that you are talking about Mm. and that you are directing to the st university students is applicable for e all, all of us and uh, that we need to maintain throughout our lives, basically. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it just, I, I don't know if you've been watching any of this live stuff, uh, streaming stuff that His Holiness Dalai Lama is doing lately, but I don't think there's one of those streams where he has not talked about education mm. as being, I think there's two things, the most important two things to him. One is that I understand. One is the reality of mother, that mother who is loving and compassionate changes the whole cycle of, uh, of 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 potential attachment to egoism, mind, all of that stuff, without that leads people who have not had that nurturing, which he says he had, which is why he is such yeah. a. He says that's why I'm so com I'm a compassionate being, uh, and when it doesn't happen, you get uh, people that their humanity has been lost to a great degree. So I think that uh, that statement about a woman being mother of compassion and love and, in, and engendering that in whatever ways that can be engendered by you know, uh, um, elders and whoever. And then the education piece, where this is not about you know, we, learning, writing, reading, arithmetic is all fine, but it is not addressing what you... Rob, are uh, addressing. So uh, talk a little bit about that and that um, just the development that you have seen and how you have worked with it you, you uh, through doing the work that you did in India and the studies that you've done and so on. And just what's it like on the ground here when you're in that class and you're working with individuals and seeing what uh, potentially can happen and what hopefully does happen. Yeah. Well, I, I love, I want to put together the two insights you have because His Holiness, in my experience as well, talks quite often about um, this relational crucible of care in which human flourishing um, is, is um, more likely. Uh, that's not to say there's not any suffering there. <laughs> But um, yeah, with someone who sees us and hears us with the 
uh, eyes and ears of unconditional positive regard. I almost think about it now as it, it, uh, it awakens something that's slumbering inside of us that has that same quality of love and acceptance and inclusion, a sense of belonging. And to be honest, I believe that that nonspecific care, we call it in science, <laughs> why does psychotherapy work, right? It's been a big question. Which form of psychotherapy works? Um, at least one answer, and it's a great debate, is um, nonspecific care seems to be um, the a really important ingredient, more so than the technique of psychotherapy. What that nonspecific I'm, care? Um, meaning more. that um, just caring. Um, it's no not reason. anything specific. Being empathic, uh, listening well, um, uh, seeing someone without the eye of judgment. Yeah, that these kinds of motherly, I think we think about that as the optimal maternal love, even though it's idealized. <laughs> um, I think that's a powerful force in, as you know, <laughs> um, uh, all of this, the, the heart, this, this rasa, this uh, love, this juiciness that it brings, this connection. And so whenever, whatever we teach, and, you know, we have a project with preschoolers in Portland, Oregon. I've worked with middle school teachers. We're now working with university students. Um, one of the things that His Holiness imparted to me was the idea that we always want to care for the caregivers. <laughs> so if we're working with the teachers because we want them to help the kids, let's care for the teachers. If we want the students to really learn these practices, let's care for them <laughs> first. Let's make them feel a sense of belonging, a sense of home. If it's the teacher, give them a taste of what we'd like them to offer to the students. So we kind of call this a cascade model. But I would say whatever, you know, that from as we're loved, so we may in turn love. And so that container of unconditional positive regard is the, for me, the sign quo non, without which not the learning of these practices will occur. And so I, I guess that puts me in a camp that says that human relationship, even if it's technologically mediated with some other being is the essence mm. of the practice here. Mm -hmm. um, and the one other thing I wanted to say is, even though I think it is so true that the, we know from brain research that even on the last day of our lives, at least in the part of the brain associated with memory, we'll be creating new connections and maybe even new nerve cells. So the brain itself, it's always learning and changing throughout life. And so we can keep lifelong uh, a lifelong learning approach to being more mindful, more empathic, um, more taking perspective, more being more kind. But the other thing we've learned is there are these windows of opportunity in the lifespan when the brain and the mind seem especially receptive and open to sculpting and shaping by um, powerful experiences, let's say. And that occurs maybe in the three, four, five-year-old zone, where there's a lot going on developmentally in the brain and the body, but also the children are moving into school and um, formal settings. So that's a great moment. And then in early adolescence from 10 to 14, we almost have another growth spurt going on in the brain. And then this transition to adulthood, uh, 18 to 25. These seem to be moments of um, windows of opportunity for this work, we call them. Mm. Sorry, yeah. I've got a little... That's okay. Some object of mine is refusing to <laughs> quiet itself. Quiet itself down. <laughs> um, we'll, uh, we'll just edit that My out. My mind has that same quality often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just won't oh, be quiet. <laughs> really, you're the only one. You're I know I'm one. alone in this. Yes. I feel so isolated. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God! Uh, lonely, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. No oh, boy. Um, so I think they're married. Yeah. The care and the learning, mm. and I, I do think, uh, and this goes to something I'm sure we'll talk about. I think without that care, without the idea of a mentor, maybe someone who's only a half step ahead of you down the path, who really believes, like me, you know, we can 
walk this path. I think it's just impossible to learn some of these things. So looking at one's mind and it's agi- without love, why, <laughs> why would I do that? Or the strong motivation of suffering to, to want a different way. So, Yeah, and uh, people getting on the path and practicing mindfulness without love is, uh, is an unfortunate recipe for judging. Mm-hmm. Yes. Without that love, without centering in a place that's behind that mind thing, uh, it can be very, very difficult. Very yeah, difficult. The, the yeah. inner and the outer critic really rear their heads, I've, yeah. I've discovered. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, so, but uh, you've talked about uh, mindfulness and compassion. These are skills. And meaning a skill is something to develop. And what have you seen with the, the reality of how uh, once you've introduced that uh, to these students in whichever way, that um, there, that's, you see this skill actually emerging around uh, coping, well-being, and, and most importantly, developing into a whole human being. What have you seen there? It's been... Um... Uh, to be honest, sometimes it's, um, and I, you know, it, it's easy to see me as the partisan scientist here, <laughs> but I've been amazed in both my own life, but in, you know, trying to do this, to teach this. So even though at Stanford, I said, I can't do research on this. I did have a course there that was based around teaching meditation to young people. So I was, I've been doing this for almost 25 years thinking Mm. about how does one teach this in a setting like this. And I'll be honest, I've been um, surprised sometimes at the um, quickness that the students report the kind of change that we're going for. Um, and, And it makes me really wonder, you know, the mind untrained has a lot of default habits that at least initially... It's like, uh, I don't know if you had this experience, but I felt like initially on the spiritual path, there was all these roses being thrown (laughs) and it was really enticing. Now, of course, roses also have thorns and (laughs) drought comes and, (laughs) but it was really remarkable to me, um, the change in my own attention. Now I didn't become, um, a person without distraction, but I definitely became more focused I think that must be so much harder now with the kinds of devices that won't behave that you <laughs> hear today. You know, I mean, it's always like your attention is obviously become the biggest commodity in the world. It's propping up the material stock market right now. That's, I understand that's our attention is the most valuable thing to, to people <laughs> who deal with technology. So, um, and it's hard And I don't think it's just about skill development. Um, I was just talking with a really good friend and for many years, and you can appreciate this too, in the traditions we talk about, let's say the Buddha, or let us say the view, the community and the practice. And um, I think secular mindfulness and compassion focuses a lot of attention on practices and skill development. And I think that's right. And I think part of that is because we're not imparting a partisan or a sectarian spiritual worldview. But we are imparting a view that the mind can change, that it changes through practice and support from a community. Um, And the understanding of that is neuroplasticity. And we can actually see that in the brain. And you can find out for yourself because you have a brain. You don't have to listen to me. (laughs) Here's the practice and let's dialogue about it. That's what the Buddha said, of course. (laughs) Yeah. So so I think there's, um, it may sometimes be giving people a view. Uh, We talk about basic goodness. You know, what are our beliefs about human nature? And So I think changing some ideas about self and the world may stand alongside of becoming um, better able to focus my attention and gain insight from my experience. I think they go together. And then, of course, there's these people (laughs) that we practice with that are mirrors and mentors and guides and 
sometimes you know keep us on the path so so i wouldn't want us to reduce what is happening here to meditation practice i think it's these three things all of which in the best case scenario are being contained by someone who really mm, has an altruistic motivation and care for the people yeah 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 um but um, a last thing I'll say, sorry, yeah. on the skill development, the other thing I think we've learned from Dan Goleman and Richie Davidson's book, which is quite interesting, is yes. it may be that changing our attention is on a longer time course than, um, say, practicing self-compassion or compassion for others, that, that the kind of... Um, unwinding and letting be and resting that that certain practices around love and compassion the effects of those we may feel those a bit sooner than trying to change our attention it might take a lot so so different practices may be on different time courses and i think that matters for the motivation of the one who's taking this up we don't want it to just be about dry <laughs> attention yeah. too much yeah. we we have to <laughs> leaven it as you know <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, that is something that we come out of directly. That combo, the, the uh, bhakti yes. Buddhist combo. Somehow he got us uh, in Karoli Baba. It it yes. emerged. He never told us to do anything. In fact, he used to laugh at us when we say, well, "You going to the meditation course?" And in English, you go to the course, and we come back. And he said, "Well, what did you learn? Show me." And we'd sit and you know and vary up tight and very tight to prove how well we learned this practice and then you just heard high peeled laughing mm -hmm. him and his, <laughs> everybody look at them they know in a minute you know so but on another level something else was going on and it is uh the the deepest part of engaging one's heart alongside of engaging self-inquiry shall we say and mindfulness is uh, a terrific combination and yeah. it's really something that we've represented and we've done at these retreats with Ram Dass while he was alive and uh, yeah the integration is I think really important um, but I wanted to ask about I mean one of the most heartening things from the work that uh, people like Richie Davidson have been doing by the word uh, the, the way that book is really great. I did a thing with Danny Goleman um, on it. Uh, uh, Altered traits. Altered traits. Yes. Yeah. Great book. Really yeah. great book. Really recommend it to the listeners if they're interested in this field. Yeah. 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 But uh, the idea that habitual patterns can be broken, can be altered. There is an opportunity. I mean, we are so stuck in thinking all of this story that we tell ourselves is real, the, the thoughts, all of it, the reactions, it all seems so damn real. And we get really, really into being a lifetime believer. Mm -hmm. And then somebody comes along and says, you know what? Actually, scientifically, we've proven that these uh, th these neuro pathways something can happen mm -hmm. that can actually change them and then you are not that lifetime believer anymore and you become open to uh, a way a potential of uh, not of, of reducing basically reducing suffering we, one's own suffering which then once that happens of course we have a chance at helping somebody else Talk about a little bit about because you've done some work directly with uh, Richie. I think around some of the students. If not, if, uh, I may be wrong. Yes, yes. Uh, currently, uh, Richie Davidson and his colleagues John Dunn and others at Wisconsin, and a friend David Germano at University of Virginia and his colleagues and I at Penn State were teaching this course called Art and Science of Human Flourishing. And the idea is um, because the prefrontal cortex of the brain is taking uh, on a long time course to develop. And this is associated with our reflection and reason and analysis, these qualities that can have us lead an awakened life. 
we wanted to put this course right at the outset of students' experience and capitalize on this window of opportunity and development. And so we've put the mindfulness and compassion meditation practice within a frame of flourishing. And we use the quote by uh, the poet Mary Oliver to sort of frame the course. Tell me, what is it you want to do with this one wild and precious life? And um, you don't have to have the answer, as my father would say to me growing up, but you should be thinking about it. It's helpful. <laughs> so just it's an inquiry, like life itself. And um, what are the supporting skills and meaning perspectives that have existed throughout time that may help us on this journey? It's not like it isn't the most important human question <laughs> and hasn't been explored over time. And so, uh, and then we're studying this to see the impacts on students. And of course, what you're saying and what we're trying to do is working against what the Buddhists would say is the habit of our mind to see things as permanent and fixed and um, unitary often that, you know, I just am who I am with, I won the genetic, I won or lost the genetic lottery. <laughs> I'm a nice person. I'm a attentive person or I'm not. What can I do? It's sort of the way things are. So this tendency to reify things including our own selves, is, again, part of this, what you're saying, I think, this view that can also um, support awakening. And then as we're awakening to this possibility, how do I find out for myself? Well, we got to work with our attention and our awareness a little. We tell them about the Delphic Oracle. She was said to have, reputed to have said two things to those who came to her. Know thyself and nothing too much. <laughs> it sounds a lot like Buddhism, you know? <laughs> so the middle path between all extremes yep. and this yep. knowing the self. So what are the skills we need to be able to realize those things? Courage and compassion and empathy and imagination and um, awareness of our who we think we are. So the whole course is really an exercise in exploring that question and, and exploring how skills like these may lead to a fruitful inquiry. Is that ongoing now? Are you doing that now? It's ongoing now. And the, the first good news is compared to these students who didn't take our course, it wasn't a randomized experiment. The students seem to learn some of the attentional and social emotional skills around focus and empathy and perspective taking we're talking about. And they also, um, report at least um, a greater sense of common humanity and a sense of meaning making. And um, it turns out that it helps them with feeling less anxious and depressed as well. And we just followed up uh, two of our cohorts for six and 18 months after the course ended in the COVID era. We followed up with them in May. And we found that compared to the other students, they were still doing better in terms of feelings of anxiety and depression, those mm. were lower in those who took the course. And a sense of, you know, trying, uh, a sense of well-being despite suffering was there. So it's possible is, the course is having an impact. We really hope to do more rigorous mm. uh, analyses of it, but we think it's working and hopefully someday soon we'll be giving it away to everyone for free. <laughs> mm. That's our mm. aspiration. Oh, wow. It's a little well-being, even though this is not discounting our day-to-day -day suffering, goes a long way. It's so true. And, you know, this idea that maybe some of our happiness and not all of it is really highly dependent on mental factors. Mm -hmm. um, sort of Viktor Frankl's um, mm. view that, you know, it's the attitudes towards conditions and our response to them that's within our grasp, mm -hmm. not the always the causes and conditions themselves. So let us at least work some on yeah. <laughs> the mind. Yeah. And uh, by the way, we've suggested, of course, or through these mind rolling podcasts and other podcasts, people to, to really take a uh, get one of Victor Frankel's books. He was oh. um, concentration camp. I mean, I can't think of any higher experiential uh, reading of one's life in the way that he, there was no way 
he was not fooling himself. He was not, no. uh, there was no way. And you realize that. Uh, so you all here are going to put the show notes together. Let's uh, put something in on that uh, Victor Frankl book because it's phenomenal. So I, uh, Rob, I found something of yours that I found very valuable for myself. Oh. So I'm, I'm, and it's once in a lifetime, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at some interview that you did, and unfortunately, I don't have the reference here, but uh, it's around gratitude. I don't know if you remember it. I don't even know how long ago it is, mm. but uh, it has some wonderful revelations in it. Mm. And you talk about gratitude being an important skill and disposition. Um, and you talk about, you can't talk about gratitude. And correct me if I'm wrong, because it's a transcription, so it may have stuff left out. You, you say you cannot talk about gratitude without talking about humility, without talking about awareness. And you talk about them being a kind of curry of those things and uh, yeah flesh flesh that out a little bit yeah and, and it's funny that you say this because we were just reading we had asked the students had they learned anything during covid in our follow-up and at least a bunch of them said um they really came to appreciate everything including their breath really a few of them said these things. Now, I actually don't know right now if those folks were in the course or not. I sure hope so. But this was a beautiful insight, right? That we assume, perhaps, and this may also, I'm sure it does, varies by privilege and status in unequal societies. But we assume a lot of things, including our next breath, including fill in the blank. And um, I think, you know, I, it could be my own emotional life, but I find myself often saying it could have been otherwise. You just never know. And so I think that awareness of um, what we've received and not received and the practice of gratitude around that, which may be the AP course. <laughs> I remember Raghu, I don't know if we want to cut this or not, but on the day of the decision at Stanford for my tenure, I actually heard my teacher's voice inside my mind saying, be thankful in this life for what you receive and what you do not receive. Mm. And it was um, no doubt a high and hard teaching. But again, in retrospect, I think there's some... There's some wisdom about being not pessimistic, <laughs> not optimistic, but just realistic in the way that Viktor Frankl is. And I think sometimes we miss this middle path of realism. We mm. think we should be optimistic or pessimistic. We think we should receive things and not things um, and not, you know, but there is this middle place. Anyways, I, I think, being aware of and appreciating what we have, the breath coming in. Thank God we don't have to be mindful of that to have it happen. <laughs> Maybe um, house, food, chance to study together, I always tell my students. Yeah. Exposure to wisdom. Wow, these are amazing things. So for me, it's almost like I don't know why this has happened. It, it makes me feel small in an awesome way. Mm. You talk about, uh, it's funny, you use the th this uh, phrase, just like me. You just talk about connecting with people deeply, and I, I can feel that in who you are, knowing you, even though for a short time, mm -hmm. uh, that's been a theme for you in life. And just like me, our mutual uh, friend, Mirabai Bush, actually has been doing a wonderful meditation, wonderful. Uh, just like me, that she has people do, sit, sit with each other. Looking time. into each other's eyes yeah. briefly, and then yeah, it is the most powerful. We use that in our course too. And oh, you do oh. just to be able to see that oh, this person has dreams and has been hurt, and um, you know uh, all of these things that we share. I think it's because the other thing, Raghu, that you know from the spiritual path, and I know from the young people today, where you know there's more anxiety and depression than there's ever been generationally is. They don't think anyone's like them. 
They think mm-hmm. they're alone and they suffer mm-hmm. and it's only their life that's imperfect. Look on Facebook or whatever, Instagram, everyone's life is perfect, right? <laughs> and so there's a large veil, um, even more so perhaps today, the Maya of technology that makes us think that it's everyone else has gotten it together and it's just me yeah. who's struggling through here. And it's just, it's just so debilitating and so untrue. Yeah, and so untrue. Yeah. And uh, th- by the way, this, I just taking a look at some of what I kind of marked off here in this interview you did. You were in India. So I don't know who got the in India, but you were in India. During the uh, gratitude interview? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I vaguely, vaguely, vaguely <laughs> remember. <You did. laughs> just to give you a little tip. Uh, a beginner's mind around that one. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, yeah, so in, in talking about this, to me, what's going on now and way before this new now, Yes. the feelings of separation for people, the feelings of isolation, the feelings of aloneness uh, have been more and more profound, maybe with the rise of social media and and the the interconnectivity through digital uh, platforms. I don't know, but certainly, I mean, because I see it, we get tremendous amount of influx, people writing to, uh, they used to write to Ramdas, or just writing to Foundation and so on, and expressing themselves about you know, what their issues were and so on. Yeah. And that certainly is a major, major issue. And so interdependence, and which is the a tenant of Buddhism. It's a tenant of every um, every tradition, really, once you get down yes, into it. absolutely. Um, you know, and I love what you say here. I'll just quote you. It's impossible not to be grateful for your life. Impossible. And this, because so many people have made it possible, right? The people who cooked and arranged your food, your parents who raised you. To not be grateful is also to miss something about reality which is we inextricably rely on each other totally for our survival. Just start there. You don't have to take an acid trip right away and get to really dig the uh, interdependence. The oneness, yeah. And the oneness and the unity. Just, just this one th- simple thought relating to gratitude is, uh, is, is a big starter. There's your starter kit. Wake up in the morning, and and by the way, you have to. There's something else that I I, I loved. I, mean, I don't want to di- get too digressed, if that's a word. Uh, <laughs> it's not. Uh, just talking about uh, psychological well-being in early uh, adulthood, um, and and you had a little uh, phrase of use of short daily momentary assessments of well-being. To me, this, like, wake up in the morning and just, you know, we all go to that sinking feel. Oh, God, today I've got a day. I don't know. Oh, that happened. Oops, I shouldn't have looked at my phone, whatever. Uh, Instead, and by the way, I'm speaking to me. I'm yes, speaking to we all always of, are <laughs> to me and all of us because we're yes. all there one way or the other, you know. Um, but to have the kind of gratitude that connects with the fact that nothing can be happening without an interrelation with everybody around us. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, you know, His Holiness, I love when he says, um, I've been granted this precious human birth. I will not waste it. Mm. Not a moment of it, right? I think sometimes we even tell our students, isn't this precious that we have a human birth, that we can reflect on these things, that we can talk to each other, that that, I assume we could assume it was a given, (laughs) but you could also assume it could have been different. (laughs) And so I think like that, and, and, you know, we do a thing with the students where we do, we ask them to think about their breakfast and Uh how many people were involved in bringing that breakfast to them. 
And so it's sort of like Thich Nhat Hans. We also do the meditation on a blank sheet of paper. Hmm. What was it that needed to happen or what it, uh, for that blank sheet of paper to be there, the clouds, the rain, the sunshine, the tree, the woodcutter, the food that the woodcutter ate, the, the truck that, you know, it's just an unending stream of interconnection. And the beauty of it, Raghu, for me is as a scientist, without that idea of interconnection, all of the sciences fall down. Mm. I mean, that's mm. what the universe is. Mm. It, that's what matter is. That's what everything is on this view. And what's beautiful is that's not different than um, certain other worldviews, as you were remarking. So there... Um, it's really real and it's really hard for the human mind to appreciate. Mm. But I don't think it's hard for the human heart to feel. Right. I think that's an ex absolutely extraordinarily um, important point. Yeah. This has come out of my dialogue with you that if we, <laughs> if we stay too heady, we may miss a lot of the, the point and the rasa and the juiciness of what this yeah. kind of practice offers. Yeah. yeah. So we just, um, I'm just thinking, I can, my mind is doing one of these things about, okay, what can we offer here in the show notes to balance out everything else that we're talking about? We talked about Viktor Frankl. We've, we've talked about his holiness, um, mindful, I mean, Joseph Goldstein, you want to get the mindfulness it's called mindfulness. It is the Bible for Westerners, for sure. Mm -hmm. All based on Satipatthana Sutras. Uh, and then, so we've got that, and we've got Victor. We need some bhakti thing. And I think that do. that bhakti thing, I would suggest, is, because um, I get this all the time, go listen to Krishna Das, okay? Oh, my gosh. Krishna yeah. Das is uh, yeah, he was with us all the way back then with Ramdas and all of us with uh, in India and has become the uh, most uh, venerated possibly is, uh, he wouldn't like that word uh, and only because he does it as practice and that's why I suggest listen to yes. him and do a little bit of practice in fact uh, every uh, thursday night and i'm sure he'll keep doing it even though this this is on a thursday night he's doing it tonight but this podcast will come out a little later thursday night at four o'clock in the afternoon pacific oh. seven o'clock he does a couple of hours of kirtan and uh and practice with people and, and experiencing that is, is a, a tremendous way to balance all the other work that uh, we're talking about at this point and uh, something else you mentioned, um, talking about the Dalai Lama, he, well, he's uh, central to this whole conversation, obviously. Um, he said, he talked about uh, the different religions of the world and the three levels. First is the common goal of more love, kindness, and compassion. Mm. And the second is philosophy. And... Uh, uh, and there's a lot of different how to realize greater love, greater gratitude, gratitude, greater kindness, and there's no problem. He said there are many different paths, same outcome. And the third level is the cultural level. And he was referring to the caste system, but he could have been talking about race relations here. Let's talk about, or please do flesh this out, um, because I think it's highly important for where we're at right now in this country. The cultural. Yeah. We're certainly at a cultural moment of change where it seems to me all of these tools and perspectives we're talking about are meant for this kind of suffering. And um, maybe they need to be adapted in new ways that they haven't been in the past. Um, I, I'm not sure what His Holiness was saying about the cultural level, but it seems to me when we look around, it's sometimes hard to see isms from the cushion. I'm not sure contemplation is up to the job by itself. In fact, I, I don't think it is of resolving structural and systemic issues. I think the cultivation of a beloved mind through these practices that can bear suffering and hold joy is so important. But apropos of what we're talking about with the heart and community, I think without the beloved community, the kind of change that we need now 
in uh, policing, in how we treat each other politically, <laughs> in how we interact just in society. I think that's um, how to build a beloved community that builds, that bring, that draws on beloved minds that can hold anything but that is not sufficient to change everything. I think that's a social action. And I think this is the moving, which Ram Dass and Mirabai and you, the idea of service, <laughs> spirituality without service is sort of lame, without engagement in the time, cultural problems of our times is lame. And so I'll give you just one example in the work on compassion that we've been thinking about. I think we teach people how to generate compassion, but Lately, we've been thinking about what does it mean for people from different groups who've had differential treatment throughout history to generate compassion just um, non-referentially? Might there be some forgiveness and truth-telling and reconciliation that may form a predicate to some of this work? Um, might we want to think about how just like me, no one wishes to suffer and everyone wishes to be happy, that that's true and that surplus suffering is fabricated in human society so that not all people experience. Obviously, we see that suffering is apportioned differently. And so how do we start to adapt these practices for the different needs and experiences of different groups in society and in culture? Um, I think this is where we are in the contemplative world. And I think part of the tension and the excitement is how to embrace and include <laughs> diversity and keep an eye on common humanity, but not go around the one to the other. Mm. Not just say, oh, we're all the same, because I don't think that's manifestly true. So how do we hold the diverse sufferings and address them? the unique needs, and remember we're all in this together. Um, and, and how do we see that each person is just like me when all of our sensory apparatus and a whole bunch of conceptual stuff behind that is, um, and the world in its, uh, is pulling in a different direction. Yeah. Or projecting wildly out of each individual mm. without any basis except the first three chakras, right? survival and power. power and, and, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The ego. <laughs> These are very powerful samsaric forces. <laughs> There's no doubt yeah. about them. And, yeah. Yeah. and I think that, you know, our own heart is a hedge against that in society. But, wow, we need a whole bunch of hearts yeah. to really stand uh, for a different kind of future. Yeah. And, you know, the work you're doing, Rob, you're just this, because uh, it's so systemic, the lack of this kind of education in our educational system uh, is so important. And uh, I'm hoping uh, Rob and the foundation have been talking about doing some stuff around Ram Dass together. And uh, I, I really look forward to that, to whatever contribution can be made from that side. Yes. And uh, and the interesting thing in this last uh, little thing, we're almost at our timing here, and just that you said here, and it's so damn true, in America, everything is filtered through an individualistic frame. It's why people won't wear masks. It's my right. You cannot take... It's righteousness. It has nothing to do with science. Nothing to do with thinking about anybody else. There's that streak in in people in this country, and uh, and you talk about mindfulness as a self help technique, which is how it's considered here in the West, which is so true, right? And in the my beautiful mind, yes, <laughs> my beautiful yoga body, yeah, right. It's unbelievable. We are unbelievable, and but the understand. It's not the understanding you say of the Asiatic traditions. It's about coming into a sense of communion and interdependence. And if we could get more, and and that's a process of education. It's a process of uh, engendering our daughters and our sisters to be 
able to hold us eventually in a way that is so full of compassion and love that our humanity is going to be intact as we come, become adults. And between those two, th- which is the th- little bit of the theme of our... I told you something would happen, Rob. You were saying, what, what are we talking about here? What we- I don't know, <laughs> but something will happen. I didn't want to practice not knowing. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think those two things are, are very much uh, a prescription that... Uh, and you, you've been in the center of it, and I thank you for that. And, you, uh, thank you. And you remind me of a little poem by... Uh, my Angelou, you know, I, um, and this may bring us back to His Holiness's um, maternal care as one of the seed beds of compassion and flourishing. Um, my Angelou says, the ache for home lives in all of us. The place where we can go and not be, the place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. And so I think this metaphor of home is very beautiful and generative for flourishing. And I think the notion that we want all of our family, all of our brothers and sisters to feel at home and that they can be as they are and not be questioned. I think that's the, what we're being called to. And, you know, the thing I love about Viktor Frankl's book is most of us, and this may be both privilege and American individualism, think that we have to find meaning in life. But what Viktor Frankl does in that book is ask us, what is life asking of us in terms of our responsibility, our ability to respond to what is? So meaning, <laughs> it may not be self-generated, he's saying. It, it, it often comes as a response to the causes and conditions over which we don't have control and how we respond is where the meaning is made. So I, I find that in my own life very difficult to try to bring this work into the social justice world, but it, it's so pregnant with meaning and it's, um, you know, I'm imperfect at it, but I'm trying and I think this is sort of spiritually what we're being called to, uh, to respond to that. And, in as best way we can, all of us. Yeah, and boy, are we getting an opportunity to put it all in practice these days, are we I think this is the moment for it. And and to remember Ahimsa. Yeah. Yeah. Nonviolence, you know, violence is not going to dispel violence. Only loving kindness dispels Mm -hmm. violence. This is the law, ancient and inexhaustible, said the Buddha. (laughs) You too shall pass away. Why must we quarrel? Yeah. Martin Luther King said the same thing not that long yes. ago. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rob, for Thanks, being uh, here. Thanks for befriending and, me and having me, oh, Raghu. Oh, God. I'm, I'm <laughs> just lucky, lucky, lucky. Me lucky, too, me lucky. too. This is my grateful. <laughs> Thank you. This is Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com. And there are so many great teachers and podcasters and thought leaders and guests and so on uh and we're, since we're we're ta- we we have to mention one more book which is sharon salzberg's oh. real change also yes. something very necessary for us all sharon is has a way of elucidating these hmm. subjects uh that is so so much of what rob and i have just been talking about the combination of mindfulness and love basically yes, so, so yeah we'll put that up there too and uh we will see you all next week bye bye <laughs>